Okay. Hey. <laughs> so um, first thing is I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation. I would also like to extend my respect to elders past and present and any First Nations people tuning in today. Um, sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Yes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is S. I am speaking today from the unceded territories of uh, the Coast Salish peoples, which includes the territories of the Musqueam Nation, the Squamish Nation, and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Wonderful. Otherwise awesome. known as Vancouver in so-called Canada. <laughs> so today we're talking uh, about the awesome series Motherland Fort Salem and the brilliant representation that the show offers. Um, Speaking to me today from Vancouver, as you said, is one of season two's awesome new faces. On screen, they're the badass common leader that guides our bellwether unit through War College. Off screen, they're equally badass, an incredible performance artist, and an absolute inspiration. So excited to welcome S. Hodomosa. Um, yay, we'll put in some. <laughs> first things first, in this world of military, which is you play M, uh, would you mind giving a really quick rundown of your character and how they're fitting into season two? Yes, the character description that I was given for M when I uh, first did the self-tape for the show was as follows. M is dryly funny, loyal, magnetic, and though a casually confident leader, takes zero shit. M is very protective of our unit and any witch in their coven. I think that does accurately sum up how that has played out in season two. I think so too. Um, <laughs> We meet M for the first time near the top of episode two in season two, uh, as they orient the Bellwether unit to War College. Uh, and then by mid-season, we see that fiercely loyal side of M coming out as they come to the rescue of Abigail Bellwether along with Tally Craven. And let me see, they guide our unit through the traditional episode four pagan holiday episode yep. of Sawin in season yep. two. Uh, there are saw and tour guide and then of course they are fighting alongside the rest of the coven at the finale of season two which was a bonanza yeah <laughs> yeah amazing um so how did it feel for you personally to come into season two with the cast already pretty tight knit and like with covid that would have made connecting with your castmates a little bit more complicated i would assume so what was that like for you um Yes, COVID has made everything very complicated. That's an accurate statement. Uh, so backstory, um, I'm relatively new to the world of acting, especially compared to a lot of my co-stars on Motherland Fort Salem. Uh, I'm not new to the film and television industry, but I'm new to like acting in the sense that I got my start in the film and television industry as a stunt performer. Yeah. So I started doing stunt performing, some stunt doubling, and then stunt acting, which is this funny little hybrid category uh, because stunt people are notoriously bad actors. Like really? they actually call it stunt guy acting. If you do like a cheesy reaction, it's called <laughs> stunt guy acting. There's a reason why we're paid to fall down and not emote, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, I'm okay at both. And uh, that means for stunt acting, you like say a line and then get kicked down the stairs or you say right. a line and then get hit by a car or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, gotcha. um, so that's how my acting started. <laughs> but um, stunt culture on set is really different than acting culture on set. Okay. And like, I wasn't a drama kid in school. I don't have theater training. I didn't do voice lessons. So my only frame of reference is like stunt guy culture, right. which is, you could write a PhD thesis on that. But of the many implicit things you have to learn on set, one of them is like, don't bother the actors. Like, don't talk to them. Don't look at them. Don't talk to them. If you're not doubling them, just pretend you don't exist and sit in a dark corner of the studio until it's time to pretend to get shot for something. Um, yeah. And it's like, I don't know if that's true of everywhere, but that's the communities that I kind of came up through. Yeah. And um, that means that like, to finally get back to your question. <laughs> In terms of like onset culture and coming into a group of pre-existing actors, like it's all new for me anyways. I'm just yeah. like, what do we do here? Do I, what's, what's the signal? If you're wearing headphones, I leave you alone. Cool. Okay. If you make eye contact, do I come over? Like, do we, do we talk in the green room or do like, are you studying your lines? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you're right. Obviously, like 
you all know at this point that like everyone on cast is a big sweetheart. Everyone's yeah. very welcoming. Of course. I don't know if it's normal for people to spend more time together outside of set hours mm. or, or, or not, you know, because like Motherland also has a really big ensemble cast. Yeah. So it's like, even though everyone's very lovely to each other and gets along just great, uh, there's long stretches of time where like a bunch of people you're getting along great with have five days of shooting where they're waking up at 5 a.m. and getting home at midnight and you're just like, well, I'm in my hotel room this week. I'll just stay here, I guess. Yeah. Um, did that answer your question? I think so. It's so interesting that there's such a different culture. I do just want to say, because I should have interjected, you're doing fantastic. <laughs> if, you, if, there's a, if there's some sort of uh, worry in there, if you were doing stunt acting, then you must have been the best out of them because your acting is impeccable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Not me thinking you're referring to this interview right now. I'm like, you're oh. nailing it. Oh, also this. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're both doing great, right? We've only been going for a couple We're both, both doing, doing fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you know, like stunt people are also like, it's a very close knit community out of necessity. Like you go to work and you're trusting your coworker with your life that day. Yeah. Um, going to set as an actor is, is not always easy either. You're going to set and you have to feel big feelings and trust that that person that you're in the scene with is going to give you back what yep. you need. But um, gosh, there's so many things, but in terms of stunts, it's like stunt people don't, talk about doing stunts at least the Canadian ones that I know I know American stunt culture is probably a bit different but like there is a reason why we don't know stunt people's names right yeah. you know actors names but you don't know the names of their stunt doubles yeah and at least like from what I picked up internally living in that world for half a decade it's seen as an unacceptable degree of narcissistic ego to ever promote yourself in the way that right. actors promote themselves so if oh. I was Okay, the size differential is humorous, but if I was Rael Collar's stunt double, I'm not, then um, <laughs> I would I would never be doing this interview, right? Like yeah. my, my coworkers would be like, what, who do they think they are? What the hell? You know, yeah. like it would be unforgivable. Right. And at least here as well, like stunts don't function through audition. You're basically texted or called by a stunt coordinator who says, hey, bud, can you work tomorrow? <laughs> the answer should always be yes. Yeah. And then that's it. So it's like, you really depend heavily on your social contacts working as a stunt performer in Canada. Yeah. And you don't want to do anything to mess that up, which usually means like saying anything, bothering the actors, et cetera. So now gotcha. I'm on the other side of the fence and I'm just like, hello. <laughs> Someone let me into this room. I don't know if I was supposed to be allowed into this room, but I'm here now. Does so anyone want to talk to me? <laughs> I'm the one on set always running around telling people like weird animal facts. Really? But yes. Okay. Okay. Mind blowing. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Did you know that woodpeckers during high speed pecks wrap their tongues around their brains to keep them safe? Really? That's yes, so cool. Really? <laughs> I know. Okay. So there you go. I guess I did have a funny story. Whoops. That was a bit of a face. <laughs> it's because the brain would be doing this. So the tongue just like keeps it. That's crazy. It's like a, it's like a tongue seat belt. That's probably inappropriate. But it's, it's like a tongue seat belt. Hmm. Let's let's not let Twitter get a hold of that one. Uh, let's move forward. Let's move forward. Let's keep going. <laughs> so I feel like we're still very much in the process of getting to know M. We've seen them on quite a... Um, surface level um we got to seeing that loyalty towards the end of the season um they're clearly absolutely just fearless which is so cool to see how do you see sort of that development like in your mind I don't know how much backstory you've been given but where are they sort of coming mm -hmm. from that's getting them to that point of being very like you know <laughs> yeah um this one's a little tricky to answer in the sense that yeah. Can't give any season three spoilers. Also, like, they're still writing stuff. Yeah. Like, I don't, I have things could be totally different than what I've been imagining to, like, get myself through yeah. scene practice and stuff, like, so far in the show. So I'm happy to, to share what I've been working with, um, yeah. with the heavy caveat that that might be totally erased of at course. some point this of season course. that I just don't know yet. 
like I was just saying, having such a big cast does make it hard to like really dig into the backstory of a lot of characters, you know, like we don't know much about Isadora's backstory. We don't like, there's, there's, there could be so many spinoff shows for Motherland, I feel like. Um, I think, so what I've been working with for M uh, has come from a place of needing to figure out how transgender and non-binary people fit into the world of Motherland, which anyone with eyes and or ears can perceive very quickly as being heavily structured by binary expectations, norms, and ideals, right? When witches are conscripted, it's like you're going into the boys camp or the girls camp and those are your two options, which raises the question of like, how did M even get here? Um, I think that while motherland is utopian in many senses in terms of like queer representation, or being a platform to discuss or showcase, even if it's not discussed explicitly, subjects that we don't see other shows maybe exploring as much, and that's why people like the show so much. Um, I'm not sure that it was a good time for M, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I think that M's casual confidence comes from a little bit of a dark place. I think that it's, they would have had to move through the world of basic training in one sense or another that would have told them repeatedly that they didn't fit yeah right yeah uh i don't think we've seen we haven't seen any evidence that the army makes special exceptions for non-binary witches Mm -hmm. we could extrapolate that there's space for transgender witches who do like align with binary presentations of gender in fact i think it would be a complete non-event um because like as long as you're a male or female witch then that's fine with everyone yeah and this sorry sidebar pet peeve whenever we're talking about trans people we're like oh a male witch or a female witch and it's like i know we have this like very unfortunate affiliation of binary sex being equivalent to binary gender which of course is not Mm -hmm. but uh (laughs) i'm just like male and female are like words to denote like biological sex categories but we interchange them colloquially with like man and woman yep yeah. Okay. It's infuriating. But I agree. <laughs> I am using it colloquially because yes. it's going to sound really weird if I'm like, yeah, using language appropriately. Yeah. yeah, M is M is not a male witch and M is not a female witch. Um, and we also know that like all witches grow up knowing that they're going to be conscripted into the military at 18. Like it's a unavoidable pipeline to military duty, which means that I think it's probably likely that young witches are raised knowing what's coming for them at 18. Their parents would have been in the military yeah. since witches are encouraged to procreate with one another and not do outcrosses mm-hmm. like rail collar, yep. which means even if M knew who they were from an early age, they would have had to internalize and come to terms with the fact that they're living in a world that doesn't have space for them that yeah. doesn't make space for liminality, that doesn't make space for fluidity even past 18. Like maybe the military makes space for witches to transition after conscription. Mm. I'd like to believe that. Yep. But then you're going to have to go to the men's camp or the women's camp. Those are your options. Because yeah. okay. even the gender rules within the world of Motherland Fort Salem are so prescribed. Like men make weapons, raise children, yep. explore relational knowledge, and then women go to the front lines. So if you think about what that psychologically does to people, I think a lot of people watching the show might resonate with that feeling of having to live multiple lives. All of us are different with different people, right? Like in in positive ways and negative ways, right? Like I'm going to act differently to a bellman who comes to the door at the hotel than I am to Arlen, who's living a few floors above me, who plays Nikta, right? And it's not because I've got anything against the doorman or something, whatever for Arlen, it's just... That's human nature, right? Of course. And I think that as much as it's something we all have to learn how to navigate as gracefully as we can, it can be deeply painful for us. And if we feel things strongly, uh, then it can be that much more difficult to traverse. So it's like um, some of their main values and priorities are that responsibility and sense of duty to the military and their nation, right? Like they're very aligned with the role of the military in many ways when we meet them, but they would have had to reconcile the fact that they just don't fit. So what do you do with a dream that you've been raised to pursue, except everything about you being there doesn't make sense and there's no other option for you. And would have had to decide at some point that they can be miserable 
or just be like, well, fuck it, I'm here. And I think it's the latter yeah. course of action that M would have found at some point during basic training in order to make it to the place that we finally meet them in that episode two debut. You almost made me cry halfway in the middle of that, by the way. <laughs> so uh, anyway, let's. I don't think it's easy for any of us, like no. whatever it is. And it's just like, you know, I was having a conversation with um, one of the head writers in the show, Brian Studler, about this just a week or two ago. And he's like, well, you know, we never actually name that anyone is gay or queer in the show. And it's, you know, like there's lots of shows that do this, right? Like we want to be able to go into this world and believe or read onto it that it could be in a, a bunch of eras or a bunch of places or a bunch of timelines. And yeah. so it's like, I wanted so badly for that to be the case with this. And maybe it will be in season three. I don't know. Yeah. But like, it does break my heart a little bit where I'm just like, oh man, even in the world of motherland, I'm not sure that like, it's, it's not a safe space for everybody. We know that. Right. Yeah. But it's like, there is nuance here that we're not able to explore explicitly because we've only got an hour for each episode. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm just here writing in my journal. Yeah, no, I would, I would love to see in season three, um, M be presented by their pronouns. I think in season two, we did have just their name. Um, but yeah, if we could get some of the pronouns in there, that would be, that'd be awesome. Um, this has been a point of contention raised by many people. Yeah. I raised it in season two. I really hope we see it in season three. Yeah. I think things are looking positive in that direction. Marvelous. That's that's good. Um, I did see, yeah. I saw your Instagram post where um, pronouns were put on the call yeah, sheet. Yeah, the pronouns yes. to the call sheet. Yes, yeah, I was that's amazing. the troll about that just this morning. Really? <laughs> that's a, No, but that's super cool. That's awesome. I've never heard of that before. I haven't either. Um, and like, it's, it's opted. You don't have to. They send yeah. out the email and lots of people have signed on. So we've got people on there with, she her pronouns and he him pronouns we've got a few people with all pronouns or any pronouns like it's really cool and it's kind of cool to see the call sheets evolving as people are like oh what do I feel comfortable with on there that's so um, cool yeah and I think it's an important part of a larger conversation about I'm on screen as M uh, uh, and whether or not we get to explore what that non-binary presence is like in the world or not. There is the flip side of like representation in the workplace in terms of film and television. Definitely. And even if people have like the very best of intentions, like to, to gender people properly, to not use people's dead names on legal paperwork, that did not happen on Motherland. Yeah. It happened on a different show. So much of my new limited experience in the industry and the capacity that I'm working now has been a roller coaster in terms of like, ah, when I go on set, I don't get the option to just show up on set as an actor. Like I have to show up on set and I'm having conversations with people about gender identity every day because people really want to know. And maybe they're from some small town and they haven't met a trans person before. And it's like, you don't want to not talk. And I also, I mean, I love talking to people yeah. and I love talking about identity because like just sometimes meeting somebody who thinks even remotely like you or like someone you know can be a life-changing experience in a positive way, right? So every moment's an opportunity, but I don't get to go to work and just do the job I was hired yeah. to do. I have to go to work and also do these other things. And uh, the pronouns on the call sheet, I think is such a big win because it's like people who have the best of intentions still require time to like change the way that we use language. And I don't know if this is a byproduct of internet culture being so fast paced Mm -hmm. and like people's mounting anxieties about cancel culture in relation to the pace of the internet but like I think there's a very troubling dialogue about like when someone tells you their pronouns like you need to get it like right then right now yeah of course there's exceptions to people who like are trying or treat it as like a memorization exercise when really it's a hey I think it's time to shift how you see the world a little bit for yeah. a variety of reasons um and like a call sheet, it's a cheat sheet with people's names. Like we, we have people's, all of the camera ops always have a sticky note with the actor's names and the character name next to it. Yeah. Cause like they're doing a million things. They're thinking about lenses, and focal length, yeah, yeah. like panning shots. And they're listening to the director this year and the DOP in this year. And they're supposed to remember your name, like God yeah. help them. And it's like, of course you're going to get people's pronouns wrong. Of yeah. course. Like it's a really intense work environment. And so it's like, how can we help people out instead of making this a punitive experience? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that there's also that element of the more that everyone puts their pronouns out there, the less likely it's going to be that um, it is a shock to people to use the correct pronoun for anybody because you're seeing it over and over again. You just go name there. Yeah. Awesome. Off we go. I did have a bit of anxiety about it because it's like not everyone is also in a place where they're ready to have that conversation. So yeah. it's like, do they have to out themselves before they're ready to like for this yeah. purpose? But like I said, it's an opt-in, not a mandatory thing. Yeah. Or even like bad, like there's lots of people on this cast who are not from Canada or the United States and who speak like five other languages each. And all of those languages are structured so, so differently. Wow, yeah, Sean Connery moment, so differently. <laughs> Sorry. But like, man, like some, some languages are, like everything is gendered. Like the yeah. table is gendered, the window is gendered, yeah. the laptop's gendered. Yeah. There's other languages that don't have any gender, but maybe they have nouns that are gendered, like mm -hmm. mother instead of person or whatever. Yeah. And then we have English. So it's even like, I've been having a lot of conversations with my trans and queer friends about like, what does decolonizing gender look like? Because it's like, as much as these conversations are happening around pronouns, it's actually a very English specific conversation yeah, in the context yeah. of pronouns on a call sheet. Yeah. This could be divided 50 million ways to Sunday. And at the end of the day, I think it's probably a step in the right direction, yeah. but I'm always thinking over time about this stuff. And I'm like, oh God, is this excluding someone? Is this making someone uncomfortable? <gasps> Going back more into the narrative of the show. So let's speak about season two. Let's yeah. cut off season three. Um, were there any characters in season two that M didn't have the opportunity to interact with uh, that you would be interested to see that interaction? I think, okay, on the basis of badassery and ass kicking alone, can we all please recall Dimitri McKinney as Anacostia in that like foxy brown getup? I love it. Absolutely destroying <laughs> Jack or like, Yep, that kick, uh, outstanding. <laughs> and it was her. What? That was her. Like, I, I'm I, not shocked that it's her, but just amazing. Like, obviously, she also has a stunt double who also yep. did amazing. Yep. But like, I saw the like the monitor footage, and I was like, "How'd your leg get up there?" <laughs> like, what? <laughs> it was an outstanding was, kick. It was so cool. Was so good, and like, she works so hard. She does like she goes to fight training multiple times a week and she's been working like really hard on her kickboxing and her boxing. And I was like so proud of her. Yeah. Like it really showed. I was like, oh shit. Um, so like honestly, just for like the team up. Yep. Oh, yep. how freaking cool would that be? That'd be amazing. That's yeah, hands down. I gotta say, a fight scene with Anna, like with Anacostia. Yeah. I don't know if I'd want to go up against Anacostia. Well, and well I didn't do their fight in stilettos. That's all I want to say. That's okay? very true. But no, I've that been hit be... by a car in stilettos for a stunt, but I've never, I've I'm, never. I'm so glad you added for a stunt then because I was about to be like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, sidebar, I have been hit by many cars and not been paid for it outside of the context of stunts. And that's why I don't bike in the city anymore. Yeah, good. Okay. So we've got Rayo the Fixer, Tally the Noah, um, mm -hmm. Abigail the Blaster, Scylla's and Necro. Uh, what do you think the M specialization is? Well, we're gonna see something in season okay. three. Gotcha. I'll give you a little, a little hint. But if we're doing the cutoff thing where we only look at season two, yep. I think we might call M like the protector. That's literally all we see them doing all yeah. season, besides occasionally sassing members of the coven. Yes, yes, the uh, the super cool hair. <laughs> There's a lot of smirking and a lot a of sassing. Lot of yep. But yeah, I think uh, like right down to the character description, it's it's either I'm the protector or I'm the ass kicker. And I yeah. mean, I'm fine with either. So yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's perfect. <laughs> um, we'll go back to uh, sort of the relationship with M and the Bellwether unit. So mm -hmm. in the finale, um, you see them very much acting like an older sibling, like you said, very much protector, very much, you know, don't you take them type thing, which is very cool to see. How do you see those dynamics with each of the girls? If we're, again, still just sort of talking about season two. Right. Ah, uh, man, let's see. I think overall, the older sibling vibe you're giving is like a pretty good summation because we're obviously not in strict military land here. Yeah. We're tolerating a lot of sassiness, which yeah. I think is great. Um, I would say in general, I think that M's attitude 
M's attitude to this is that the coven should be brought through war college like as successfully as possible. Like I think as much as they're an older sibling, like they they really want everyone to succeed. And I think that M has like a sensitivity to that looking different for each member of the coven. Gotcha. So unlike maybe a season one Abigail Bellwether, who's like come hell or high water, you're doing it the Bellwether way. And yeah. then of course, like over the arc of the season being like, okay, we all have our strengths. Yeah. <laughs> I think like it's like I think if M's an older sibling, it's like the 10 years older sibling. Yeah, vibe. okay. Gotcha. Not that the age difference is that big, but it's like, okay, let's go with like so with Rael, for example. M is like the first instance we have is like one of the snarkiest, um, which was delightful to shoot with Taylor. Yep. That was the first day that I met her on set. And I was like, great, <clears throat> we're doing this. Um, cool. But Oh, it's hard to divide it into three. Sorry, I'm gonna have to yeah. go back to talking about this generally for a second. It's like M is allowing space for each of these people to like make mistakes as well throughout the season. So like one thing that comes to mind is like the sparring session that we see happening with Tally, I think in episode three. And it's like, Tally is not the most physically skilled out of the coven, right? And like, it's something the show like kind of like pokes at or plays with. Yeah. Um, and like, that's fine because she's basically a superhero with all the other stuff that yes, she does, much. right? Uh, or like with Abigail, like Abigail is like a leader within the Bellwether unit. Yep. And it's also like, I mean, the show is also about our three heroes too, right? So it's like, as much as Em is a leader of the coven, we still have a very strong sense that like Abigail is running the unit yep. or co-sharing it. You know, they all take their turns. But it's like, I thought a lot about what this leadership dynamic should be before I stepped on set with the three main cast the first time. Because I was like, ooh, reading the script, like it could come off very combative. And I was like, I don't think that M is insecure about this. I don't think M is like feels threatened by these witches who have just come into war college who are like their responsibility. Yeah. I think that we see that back and forth play of like humor and a little bit of like talking back because like M is stepping back and like seeing what everyone brings to the table. Yeah. And cool. also like and in Abigail's way of like, everyone needs to be on like their best behavior all the time. I think M has a lot more space for like people having bad days. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, because it's like, yeah, Talia like has that vision in the middle of sparring class and it's like M's immediately checking in, yep. but then like, we're not seeing M hovering over them the rest of the time. Everyone's like a very cohesive unit again by the time we hit episode four and Talia and M are right there saving Abigail from the Camarilla, right? Yeah. Um, it makes me think about, um, all right, so like in between seasons or like during the pandemic, I was doing a lot of contortion coaching online because obviously in-person stuff is not an option. And if anyone has no idea who the F I am, I, I also work as a circus performer the rest of the time, surprise. Um, so <laughs> I was doing some contortion coaching because yep. nothing else was happening and I had to pay rent. Um, and right. I loved working as a coach, but I like, started going down a rabbit hole of like reading coaching manuals and coaching psychology and stuff because I just wanted to be as good a teacher as I could yeah. and I was reminded when I was thinking about the kind of leader that M wanted to be of that expression that you find in teaching and coaching where it's like you should want your students to surpass you yeah like you should want your students to be better than you and it's like Abigail's a bellwether Abigail's practically witch royalty Tally is doing things that we don't see any other witch in this universe doing with like the seeing sound yeah. stuff. And Rael is the witch bomb. So it's just like, M knows. M yep. can't hold a freaking candle to any of these. And they're so stoked like to just go through it with them, right? Like the option would have been for M to be like threatened, yeah. but that's not the way other things were written. And I'm like, cool. I think this is like really strongly like a coaching vibe which is also why I said like the 10 years older sibling. Cause if it was only a three years older sibling, I think we would have seen squabbling. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So in my, I do this sort of as a side thing, my, the, my main job is I'm a sports coach. Cool. Um, yeah. So I, I teach soccer and all of the things to usually under 12 year olds, but that's exactly um, what I do with them because I, I'm at my point. I know how good I am. I want them all to be better than me. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that, that really resonates with me. It's just like you're watching all of them growing and getting better and better. And you're just there as a safety net for them to keep pushing them forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if they don't know it, cause like the unit is also very like wrapped up in the happenings yeah. of the unit. Right. I'm just over here. I'm just watching, waiting, yeah. ready to swoop in. Yep. Yeah. Just like in the garage, just ready to be like, oh, <laughs> trouble. Okay. <laughs> 
if you could create your own piece of work, whatever it is, Taylor, I think said something to like help her get ready in the morning, like very bewitched. Yes. Um, but what would it be? I don't know if you can hear the sirens coming through my headphones. In the I background. can, yeah. <laughs> uh, the hotel is located two doors down from an ambulance fire truck dispatch. And so this oh. is all night and all day. Oh, and then there's also jackhammers and buzzsaws that happen all day right outside the window. Good. So this is not exactly a theoretical work selection for the greater good, mm -hmm. but like reading over, like thinking about the answer to this question, immediately the first thing that comes to mind is I'm like, I wish I could have a magical audio barrier <laughs> because like, okay, I haven't actually like shared this like publicly online anywhere yet, but I'm going to, so whatever, fuck it. Um, I got uh, an adult autism diagnosis this summer, which okay. was great because yeah. life makes a lot more sense now, but it's also been awesome. really overwhelming. Cause I'm like, oh, I need to go through this whole bowl of my life's memories and take them out one at a time and be like, was that autism? Is what it felt like in the beginning. Yeah. This is a few months in now I'm doing better. Yep. Obviously this didn't just magically start when I got my diagnosis this summer. Yeah. This has been a lifelong thing, but I have a really hard time with sensory overstimulation and sound is a big one of those. So like, gotcha. I usually have these headphones on on set and it's just like, I will push and push and push and push and like be a happy, shiny person. Uh, until I break. And I just thought that everyone does that. And mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out why other people don't like shove their fingers in their ears anytime like a siren comes by. Yep. But um, it is distressing. And like certain frequencies and pitches of sounds if they last long enough make me literally want to throw up. Like I get okay. physically nauseous. Yep. And I'm like, wow, what would life be if I could just not have to walk around with these giant like over the ear headphones all the time mm. just to have a normal day that'd be great I think idea. I would have way less autistic shutdowns if I could have that work because like it'll build for me over like the course of several days or even okay. weeks yeah. and then like for me like it turns into like a situation where I go like non-verbal for a period of time okay which can be very badly timed depending on the context of the situation and then like there's nothing for it except waiting for my brain to reset and come yeah. back online yeah just so yeah good. I live in fear of that happening like at work one day. Film sets are loud places and you need to be on because if yeah. you're not on, your crew or your cast are going to be like, what's wrong? Are you okay? What happened? Talk to me. And then yeah. I'd be like, if I don't, if I can't, if I've run out of spoons to like mask that day and I'm just like nothing, then like it's not going to go well. And then I'm going to have to do more emotional labor to reassure this person that like, blah, 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 blah. so yeah, magical headphones would be great. Perfect. Magical invisible headphones. Awesome. Would they just cut out like a like a like the um fire truck frequency? Just like anything above great. that? Yeah. Yeah. Or like, do you know like like a metal water bottle? Imagine dropping that from shoulder height onto concrete. That <laughs> the really good thing that Motherland did was the uniform. I loved the um M's uniform, how it had nods to the unit's uniform and nods to the male witch's uniform. Um, did you have sort of a hand in that or was that very much the costume department? Like, and also how were you feeling about that when they first showed it to you? Uh, yes to both. So yeah. the costume department did contact me first. It was the first contact I had with anybody on the show, um, which I'm very grateful for because yeah. they're lovely. And they asked for my input on the costume. So they sent me the, the drawing mock-ups of like what the men's jackets look like and what the women's jackets look like. So we've seen both in season one and they were like, Hey, so we're going to start designing M's costume. What do you think? Um, and I actually went through my emails and I dug up the email that I had with Tracy Bolton, who's the costume designer for the show. Yeah. I can share it if you like, this was the conversation that we had nearly. Please, if you feel comfortable doing that, please. Yeah. Nearly a year and a half ago. So like, I want to preface this by saying like, first of all, it's before season anything that I had done for season two I hadn't even seen scripts yet so okay. it was this huge shot in the dark I knew that I had been hired to play a non-binary character yep. I had obviously binge watched season one the of second course. I even like received the self-tape request yep. I was like I don't even know if I'm gonna get this when I'm watching it <laughs> um <laughs> and then it's freaking fantastic so yep. obviously I watched it all very quickly yep I didn't really know what was going to happen with Em in season two which yep. are things that we've already discussed today but they had kind of been like, what do you think about a blend of the two? And I was like, yeah, like 
this is the tricky thing about non-binary representation, I think. And I think we're also at a point in visual media, TV, film, like it's the leading edge of that representation. And we've seen such a narrow pie slice of the massive spectrum of non-binary identity working in stunts. And then the few gigs that I had had prior to Motherland had kind of left me with this feeling that, not even a feeling, a, a deep-rooted anxiety that a lot of people do equate non-binariness to androgyny, uh, which is obviously patently false. Yeah. But it's a problem because like I present very androgynously. Like yeah. I've always felt like gender is a performance. Um, and I love the performance. Like I'm a circus performer. I perform on TV and film. Like it's yeah. it's fun for me sometimes. Uh, um, other times it's a real drag, but no pun intended. <laughs> Sorry, that was too easy. Um, I It was important to me where I was like, okay, realistically, and this is like, I think the tension that a lot of non-binary people feel is like, regardless of the fact that genders outside of a binary understanding of the world have existed time immemorial yep. when it comes to visual media how do we reconcile that reality with the fact that if you're not explaining that explicitly sometimes people try to try to visually categorize it into one or the other so when I go out in public people try to categorize me as female or male yep. or they make that assumption and it's like that's really hard at a certain point in I think people's gender explorations or transition, um, but like knowing I was coming into the show as a non-binary actor playing a non-binary character, I was like, I just really want to make sure that the wardrobe department and I are on the same page about this because there's two costume options. It's the military, it's a rigid hierarchy, even if it's matriarchal, like yep. they're not going to make M like a special colorful costume. Yep. Like it wouldn't yep. make sense, right? Yep. So I was like, oh, okay. I wrote to them, yes, you guys had already thought that we were going to go somewhere about a blend of the two between the men's jacket, but we don't have the pocket details that we see on the women's jacket. And the first instincts for what feels appropriate for M from the files that were attached was something leaning slightly more towards the men's design than the women's design, uh, purely for body silhouette purposes. So as an aside from that, it's like I've had top surgery yeah. and the women's costumes are cut to sit like above the pelvis. And then they angle down in the front. So it kind of creates that like hourglass figure, which I have paid a lot of hard earned money to not have. <laughs> so I was like, yep, I'm cool with that if I have to. But if we don't have to, I if like these ones it. better. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's not the character, that's fine. Um, they were like, no, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, nice. Then I was like, here's some ramblings and musings of mine. If it helps inform other decisions that are being made in your wardrobe department about M. Um, I wrote that the white, short-haired slash shaved head non-binary actors that we see on our screens already tend to be presented on screen as transmasculine. So we have Asia Kate Dillon from Billions or Theo Germain from The Politician. And there's very little freedom or blending of gender presentation there in regards to wardrobe and what we see on camera. And of course, there are thousands of decisions we're not privy to as the audience about like what goes into the character, the costume design, all that. So no shade to either of them, yep. but just in an observational sense. I wrote that I feel like the way non-binary characters have shown up thus far have had to cater somewhat to a cisgendered heteronormative audience, people who haven't started to unpack the arbitrariness of a binary way of understanding the world. Yes. So someone who's non-binary but likes a wide range in gender expression or someone who's non-binary but kind of fluid is harder for people to understand who are new to representations of transness on screen that are not binary in nature. Yep. People still equate gender identity with gender expression, which is a gross oversimplification. I said, well, I think an important part of the social conversation is starting to slowly incorporate the understanding that non-binary folks can have literally any gender expression they bloody will feel like, masculine, feminine, whatever. And my own personal expression still leans towards androgyny. Going over the notes that I have so far, I think our best options are this for the military costume. However, I didn't imagine M as being restricted towards masculine dress wear. So I wrote dresses can be fine. It's more about like the cut of the clothing for me. I have an acrobatic body. I'm an inverted triangle. Like some things don't look good on me. 
Yeah. There's just some clothes that don't look good on like whatever body type, yeah, right? So course. I'm like, just make me look good. I don't yeah. care like if it's a dress <laughs> or a suit, right? Yeah. Um, but at this point in conversation, that first contact with wardrobe, we were just talking about the military outfits. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want us to stay stuck in this box. If like M was going undercover somewhere, like we saw Anacostia going undercover yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Obviously that didn't happen in season two. I wore that awesome non-binary uniform the whole time yeah. oh and the dress the dress uniforms which are just unisex yeah except for uh I mean the like we saw Gregorio like Pranit they have kind of like those tan costumes mm -hmm. and they were like no you just wear the same one as everyone else and I was like okay um but it's fine because it's like these really cool wide like culottes yeah that could look like a skirt or like some like big wide leg capris and like really cool boots, which I feel like we don't see enough of in the show because they're beautiful. Sorry, that was the end of, of my message to the wardrobe department. I was like, let's not be limited to this. The show is already doing so fantastic with different kinds of queer representation on screen. And I know from experience at this point that people tend to be a little bit shy about starting these conversations with me as like the trans non-binary actor, because good, like for good reasons, people don't want to offend anyone or hurt anyone's feelings and people are very different. So I'm like, I like to start the conversation and offer this. And if it helps you, then great. And they yeah. took it and ran with it. And uh, we ended up with the wardrobe that we saw in the show. They were super receptive to it. And uh, they're still like one of my favorite departments on set to go hang out with. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's so amazing. Cause I, I remember seeing it for the first time and cause I am non-binary. So I, I had seen it. I, you know, I was a massive fan from season one. I saw the uniforms, they were all beautiful. And so when I saw your uniform, I was like, Oh, I just, I literally went, hold on, wait. And then I like, I remember I was like looking between the different uniforms being like, ah, oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> They, they made it close the other way to the women's wardrobe. So men's jackets close on the other side. And I feel like this random fact, once upon a time I read like back a couple centuries ago, women usually had dressers. So like their little ladies and waitings or maids would be like doing up their buttons for them. Whereas like men dressed themselves. Do it themselves. So, <laughs> I don't freaking know. And left-handedness was bad. I think those two things combined right. like, led to the things being done on opposite sides. So men's jacket, I know. M's jacket closes like the men's jackets. Um, they don't have pockets, which honestly is a regret. Just on the pocket front. Yeah. Every every gender under the sun wants pockets. Everyone okay? needs a pocket. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it looks sharp, but yeah, they lengthened it a bit. Um, just because like, it doesn't matter like if you have narrow hips or wide hips, if you cut something to sit above your pelvis, it's going to make you look yeah. a little hippier. And I was yeah. like, no. Make it go longer, please. <laughs> Please no. And then um, we never talk about this in the show, uh, but I remember being like, oh, what do my epaulets mean? And they were like, oh yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> and someone was like, I think that means sergeant. Cause like they came up with this whole like interior system, even yeah. if it never gets the light of day on the show. And there's mm -hmm. so much stuff like that on motherland. But that means that M is essentially in this, a similar category to what Anna Costia would have been when we met her as drill sergeant in yeah. season one. And there's a lot of parallels between them. Like, I think M is very ambitious in terms of like, they're on an officer track. They clearly have aspirations to go beyond that. Um, but that's what the epaulette bars mean, if you were wondering. Nice, lovely. As a non-binary actor, your presence on the screen, telling authentic stories, it's like having such an incredibly positive effect on the queer community, in particular trans and non-binary people. Um, it's so important, as we've talked about, to see yourself represented <laughs> on the screen. It's really awesome that you were able to provide that for the community, for me personally, if I'm talking selfishly. Um, it helps to reinforce that we're real, we matter, and we won't be forced to sit in the discomfort that sort of our representations have given us anymore. Um, has this representation sort of been very front of mind for you as you're going into this acting career? Because you you have said that you're sort of just starting. Yes, I try to be positive about most of my experiences, period, across the board. I think that's the way to be in the world. But I also try to be honest about stuff too, because like, there's no point in being like, yeah, fam, it's rosy in here. Come on in. Like it's, I think this might be a useful time to, to backtrack a little bit again and just offer some context with what my trajectory in the TV and film industry has been. Of course, yeah. I hope this is not the case in stunt communities around the world 
I don't know if this is just the case for the Toronto stunt community that I came up in. Because like even the Vancouver stunt community is very different than the Toronto one, which I'm sure is very different than Montreal's and Halifax's, right? Like they are close knit, tight communities. Stunt performers are part of the same union as actors. So you're, you're unionized um, in that sense, like you're part of a close knit group there. But even then it's so intensely insular. And like I said before, getting a job is obviously contingent on you doing a good job at the stunt uh, and not misrepresenting your skills, which can happen in people's eagerness to get a contract. They're like, oh yeah, I can swim. And then they can't swim. Yeah. That has happened. Yeah. Yes. That face. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's like, you need people to like you. You really need people to like you or it's just not going to work out for you. And while it's not everyone, there is a not small component of the community that I was working in for half a decade uh, that has some very strong opinions about gay people and trans people. And I remember when I started stunts, I think I was 23, maybe. Within like three weeks on set, I, I sat down. It was like a big group day. Stunt is also very male dominated. It's super rare that you're on set with stunt women, um, just because like writers also don't write a ton of action for women, especially in what they call ND roles or nondescript roles. So an ND role is like the police officer who gets blown backwards by an explosion okay. into a car, which lights on fire, which jumps off the bridge, like, or a SWAT officer or whatever. And like, if you ask the predominantly male stunt coordinators who are also predominantly white, middle-aged male stunt coordinators they'll tell you that it's because like producers and audiences just don't want to see women being hurt on screen we don't want to see a female cop getting shot in the face we don't want to see a female SWAT officer coming off the side of a building and getting mowed down in some Rambo film right yeah I don't know if I agree with that um but that is largely how the Hollywood machine seems to continue right to function yeah. If you are a stunt woman, your career is made or broken on your ability to double actresses. So like, you're just not on set with women a lot. Yeah. I was like in a in a lunchroom with a bunch of my male coworkers, and like, I remember them pulling out this phone. They were watching this YouTube video, and they started having this conversation that was like super transphobic and violent about this woman who they were watching, this YouTube creator. And I just sat there, and I was like, it was like my fifth day on set ever. And like, there's so much about stunts where it's just like, you learn things called like set etiquette, which is like, don't talk, don't be in the way, but be in the right place at the right time, but you won't know when that is. So pay attention and like all sorts of stuff that you can do, like totally innocent that will make you so obnoxious to your coworkers that you're never called again. Right. Like there's just so many social cues to read. Okay. Also in retrospect, there's the autistic anxiety. I'm like, what's happening here? <laughs> Give me a manual. <laughs> But I sat at that table and I was like, ooh, well, there's the coordinator and there's the lead double and there's the other lead double. And here's the three guys that I know have been working every day this month on the show. And I'm just here for these two days. And this is the only coordinator that's hired me so far. And I just sat there and I listened to it and I was like, hey, all right. It was unfortunate timing because like I was just starting to kind of figure out my gender identity at that point. Yeah. Um, I definitely didn't grow up with like super strong, clear feelings of gender dysphoria. I always knew I didn't want boobs. That was a super clear through line, but honestly, yeah. that was like the only thing. Yeah. And it was confusing. Cause like when I was a teenager, I don't think I, I didn't even know trans men existed until like my late teens. Like the only examples of transgender people were trans women. And I don't think I saw a non-binary person or even heard what that was until I was about 24. So like I went through my teens and early 20s being like, am I a guy? Do I want to be a guy? Like, is that what that means? I don't want boobs. Yeah. Are there women who don't want boobs? Like, I don't freaking know. And um, listening to that conversation at the table, I was like, oh man, I wasn't even out of the closet, but I like burrowed back deeper behind the winter clothes. You know, I was like, yeah. I also came really late in life to my circus career. I didn't have a dance or a gymnastics background. And I started that uh, pretty much at the same time I started stunts which was both good and terrible timing. Terrible, because it meant that I was never particularly committed to my stunt career. And it was hard, because I was like, Even so many of you are bad people. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if I want to be here. Yeah. But it was paying rent. And more importantly, it was paying for circus training, which is really expensive. And I was like, I think I want a professional career as a circus artist. What an, like, it's an utterly ridiculous dream for someone in their mid-20s to be like, that's what I want to do. But 
that's my oh, style. So that's what I did. Yeah. It's just unlikely is a better word for that. Like yes. it's, yeah, the amount of time you have to spend training to get even mediocre at a circus discipline is a mountain of time. And by the time you're in your mid twenties, you're paying your own rent, maybe and like working a yeah. bunch of jobs and like, who knows what else? Yeah. Maybe trying to have relationships if you're lucky. I don't know. I was like, okay, if I want to pursue my circus career, that means that I'm never, like, I can't come out ever, whatever that means. If I want to work in stunts, like I was like, if I do that, even like in a soft way, like a soft launch, a gender soft launch, <laughs> I was like, it's not everyone. There's people that I work with that I really love and are super fun and are very chill with this stuff, but like, they're not going to defend me because it'll also mean their job is gone. Yeah. And I can't fault them for that because they've got families or whatever else, or they love stunts. And I was like, okay, that's fine. What's more important to you, S? Do you want a circus career? Or do you want to like be unemployed, but like maybe have a better idea about your gender? And I was like, well, this is an easy answer right now. I was on set many times where those conversations happened and they were so confusing to me because like I was like I don't know where this is coming from and I didn't have any other trans or queer people in my life at the time because like it's all consuming you're on set for very long hours and if you're not on set then I was training in a circus gym for long hours every day so it's like I had circus community which is weird and wonderful and queer but like it's yeah. queer in the way that nobody talks about it no one's going to like drag brunches no one's like oh did you read this new book by this queer author everyone's like how do you do this trick Ugh. <laughs> that's it yeah. So like, it's super friendly, but it's not queer community in the way that I might have found a bit more of now. And it's taken me a really long time. Um, yeah, like, basically, non-binary representation is something that like, I kind of wish it didn't have to be like everything. But like, it's something that seems to need to be repeated so many times over and over again. Like, I reached a point a couple of years ago, maybe a year before the pandemic, where I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. I don't think I can live this like double life where I pretend that I'm fine, like doing this and being gendered as female all the time. And like, there's so many other things that come with that that are really unhealthy. Cause it's like, I was funnily enough being cast to play non-binary stunt characters or gender neutral stunt characters. So like my very, very first stunt gig ironically with like one of the most transphobic coordinators yeah was to play a gender neutral like apocalyptic scavenger in this Stephen King show where I had to like jump on James Franco's back and like it whipped into a pile of cinder blocks in the rain and I was so validating like yeah. I got to wear a binder for the first time Amazing. I got served on set for the first oh. time and I was like this like little skinny little thing <laughs> I was like <gasps> And then like, yeah, the world came crashing down very quickly afterwards. And I was like, oh, this isn't what I should oh, expect no. at work. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but I was like, oh, I got a little taste of gender euphoria. No, yeah. you can't have it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Dangling the carrot. Totally. So it's like people yeah. liked that I could present androgynously enough, but they yeah. didn't actually want me to be that thing. And I was like, okay, if I have top surgery and I like reached a point where I was like, I don't think I can put this off any longer. Yeah. I was like, I don't think I'm going to get hired anymore either in the negative sense that I've been alluding to for the last eight minutes or however long I've been blabbing, uh, or even in a, a, for lack of a better framework, a positive sense. Like I said before, the industry is so fast paced and so demanding on everyone in every position. Yeah. So not even in an individually critical way, just in a, that's the realities of the job way. Coordinators often have to hire stunt performers like the day before something or yeah. a script change comes through and everything has to be reshuffled and they're calling people for like two hours trying to get enough guys for the next day. And I think I scare a lot of people because they just don't know what I am and they don't want to offend. That's yeah, like, okay. for that community, that's like the main, I don't want to offend, it's okay, what do I call you? And I'm like, yeah. these are good conversations to happen but it means I don't get the work. And I was like, all right. I was at a point where I was like, circus was finally going well. My career was kind of taking off. And I was like, all right, even if I make less money, I think it's time to, to kiss this goodbye. And then by complete fluke, acting started. So I was like, all right, cool. Even in acting, non-binary representation is really tricky. Yep. Like we were talking about a little while ago. It's like a lot of the time people are trying to get up to speed, right? Like my agents are trying to get up to speed. Uh, casting directors are trying to get up to speed and it's coming from a good place, but it takes time and it takes intentional work to challenge 
to even uncover the frameworks that you've been like living your life by and seeing the world through, right? Yeah. It comes down to the languages you speak and the communities you live in and the life that you've had and so many things. Like it's not easy for anyone. And so it's like reading character descriptions sometimes you're like, oh, I don't think that's a non-binary character. Okay, yeah. but that's what we're doing. Or like a lot of the time I'll get call outs for like a trans woman. And I, in the early days of that, I would call my agent and I was like, what the fuck? We've had this conversation. And he had to be like, pump your brakes, dude. That's not, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, do you, do you know? I don't know if you know. He's like, no, I know. He's like, but the cast, like they don't know what they want which is true of any role, yeah. cisgendered or trans. So it's like, they just want the diversity spot on the call sheet. They might not actually want a trans woman. Maybe they just want a trans feminine person. Maybe they want a non-binary person. Maybe they're gonna change their mind and make it a cisgendered character anyways. And if we don't submit you, we're never gonna know. And I'm just like, wow, this yeah. is making my head spin. Okay, but like, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Because like, people just want it to be a simple thing. And I think the non-binary umbrella under the yeah. trans umbrella is really confusing to a lot of people because it can be so many things yeah. under that generality, right? Like, I use the word non-binary because it's a general term in the way that I use queer because it's a general term. Some days I'm even like, is non-binary even the right word? All of these like, gender presentations and aesthetics are really tied to like white supremacist and colonial ideas of what different gender roles should be. And yeah. I don't think that's okay. Should I just say I'm trans in the way that I say that I'm queer? Yeah. But then you have non-binary folks who don't identify as trans for a whole bunch of reasons. And yeah. it's just like, hmm. And of course, all that work happens back here. And then you have to show up and be like, hello, my name is S. Hodel Moser. I'm five foot nine inches from Toronto, Canada. And I'll be reading for the role of blank. It's not easy, but I think it's important work. And I go through, honestly, like I go through a lot of ups and downs with it. Like I would love to talk to other actors who have played like non-binary characters on TV and ask them like off the record what their experiences have been like. Because like the Motherland fandom is huge, but like yeah. right before Motherland, I think that the biggest gig I had was playing a character named Cindy on The Boys um, who, Trans kids on the internet, no. They were like, is Cindy non-binary? And I was like, Cindy had 30 seconds of screen time and no, like, I don't fucking know. No one knows. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? But they see me and they're like, you, I yep. see you. Yep. Give us the information. And I'm like, it's not my place. <laughs> yep. If you want Cindy to be non-binary, I'm fucking here for it. Sure. But, you know, right? Like, yeah. I'm just like, I don't know. But between like the boys and then motherland, my public visibility has changed radically in the last few years yeah. and that has brought some very unpleasant experiences so like to kind of like wrap up my very lengthy answer to your question um although I could talk about this all day it's like in the midst even of this beautiful opportunity to like be a non-binary actor getting cast for a non-binary character like in season two as we started shooting like for the I mean, lucky me that it was the first time in my life, but also unlucky me. It was like, I was starting to get hate messages for the first time in my life online. And I was like, well, this is unpleasant. Yeah. And then like kept coming. I'm like, oh, this is really unpleasant. And like, they kept coming and I'm like, okay, you can stop now. <laughs> like some days I would wake up to hundreds of messages, hundreds of messages, like telling me that I should have been aborted and that I'm going to hell. And that like the most vile violent things you can imagine and I'm just like all right okay cool so that makes you angry got it noted yeah. and then I was like trying to wrestle with that and then like show up on set and be a good rep for like non-binary community and like play this character that's like the first non-binary character on the show and trying to get my footing with the cast and like understand where the writers were taking the character and yeah I started getting death threats for the first time in the middle of all that, which like people say they do, they do. And um, it was one of those things where like the first one you get, you read it and you're like, like, Oh, <laughs> wow. All right. And then like that, like shiny veneer of humor kind of rubs away after a day or two. And you start just like thinking and you're like, wow, that's actually what someone thinks. Even if it's a 12 year old, just like, finger mashing on the keyboard I'm yeah. like that came from somewhere and then like 
really started to spiral with it. And I was like, shit, like people actually just don't want me to be here. And that means it's not just me, obviously. And like, I know these things, but it was very different to experience it in that way firsthand. Yeah. And it was really freaking hard to like go to work every day and do this thing that was like so at odds with what was happening in my personal life as a non-binary person, like as a transgender person. And uh, yeah, like there was, oh man. Yeah, it, it kind of escalated over the course of like a few months. And uh, I ended up taking like a social media break after we finished shooting Motherland. I was like trying not to, cause I was like, I'm not gonna get scared off the internet. And then I was like, wow, my mental health is really bad. Yeah, I was like, hyper vigilant all the time and like not feeling safe when I like went outside and like yeah that's that's and nothing's probably going to happen to me walking around in Canada I obviously occupy a site of like significant privilege with all the other identities that I occupy but like it was just different I don't think anything can prepare you for someone telling you that you should be lynched or that they'd like to see you shot and it's just I'm like, but I'm just a happy circus artist. Like, <laughs> you'd like me if you knew me, yeah. you know? And it's like, I don't think that like continuing to work in this industry should come from a place of like, I'll show you like with this stuff. But I think, I think it's important to share that that's what was happening. And I continue to talk about it because it's like, okay, as much as like I'm maturing and like feeling more and more at ease with myself, even as like, I feel like, at some point I'm just going to become like a gender nihilist I'm like nothing means anything words are dumb nothing exists is what you just need to nothing actually yes. exists sorry not dumb I'm trying to take dumb out of my vocabulary um Arlen's been trying to help me with that it's silly, silly. those words are silly yeah but uh yeah the representation is important but like it I don't think that that is a experience that is unique to me in this position and so I'm like wow all right it's not coming easy fine fine bring it on but uh yeah we need more of it and we need we need more <laughs> more kinds of non-binary people on screen that are not white androgynous people yeah though I am very happy to get the opportunity of course <laughs> it's just like yeah I see a lot of conversations happening online with other non-binary folks where they're just like man this is the only one I see and I'm like I hear you also I got the job I'm sorry oh shit yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I could keep going. I'm going to cap myself there. Otherwise we're just going to just roll into the night and into your afternoon. So let's, let's just put a pin there at the end of that thought. People today need to just settle down with a lot of like <laughs> in my brain, I was like, I'm going to come up with something really good, but like, just calm down. I, when I'm teaching my littles, it's very, I go by the rule of, if you don't have anything nice to say, shut your mouth don't talk yes. because it's not useful for anyone you'd never know what anyone's going through and you never know what's going to be the thing that pushes them a little bit too far Absolutely. um so i have received finally from that <laughs> interview i did with taylor i got a couple of messages on twitter that were not particularly great um i was like okay that's fine this is a thing that maybe ten thousand people have seen i've never experienced this before in my ah. life but that's fine um so it's, but it's nowhere, not fine it's not it's, it's not it's, fine I and I think I was very much still sitting in that spot of like oh there's humor facading this at the moment trying not to let that sink in yeah. um but it is a really sad thought that there are people in this world who will go out of their way to try to make people like us or anybody who is remotely different to them feel bad just for existing and make you feel like you shouldn't um, exist um, and that's super hard what I will say is that the more visible we are and the more we are represented on screen and that will come when we see more BIPOC representation in our community through media um, the more those people will have to make a choice on whether they keep going louder and louder and louder, having more arguments with people, or they'll get drowned out, hopefully, um, because there'll be enough of us that it becomes more of a regular occurrence on the television. And I think that that'll be a very nice day that hopefully we see sometime soon. <laughs> yes, I hope so. So were you prepared 
for the Motherland fandom because they are a lot. We love them, but they are, ooh, they are a lot. You know, I think because I took that social media break, it was like supposed to be two months and it turned into like seven. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I like reluctantly dragged my ass back online, like just for Twitter, which is not a platform I use. I still have a hard time with it. I like the visual mediums of Instagram and TikTok a lot more, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm not good at being synced, obviously. So like Twitter is not my medium. (laughs) I'm like 140 characters. Absolutely not. (laughs) Absolutely not. Um, I went back online for that because like the whole cast live tweets, right? Yeah. And like that was just overwhelming. That really? was just overwhelming. That yeah. part, yeah, because I was like, what is this? What is normal? What is yeah. what is the what's the dress code? Um <laughs> at like one point, uh, I was in Montreal over the summer between season two and season three, because that's where some of the best service training in the world is. And that's where one of Arlen's home bases is, who plays Nikta. Yep. And uh, Arlen was like, I don't know how to do Twitter either. And I was like, let's do it together. <laughs> and like, we were like sitting on this couch, like being like, does this tweet look good? Yeah, okay, good. What about this GIF? This is a good GIF. Okay, it's funny, send it. Like, we were so, <laughs> we were so anxious. Yeah. Um, just cause like the live stream was like, and I'm like, what's happening? And then also I'm just like, what is the age group of the audience on Twitter? Yeah. I don't know. The fandom is so intense about ships. And I'm just yep. like, if I say anything that has taken us in, okay, also, I mean, I think if I, if, if there was a world where like, I could just let all my innuendo fly with no repercussions, then like, there would have been a lot more tweets because like the show is so thirsty. Like, I'm yeah. sorry, did yeah. Alder need to like whisper? Penelope's ear. Absolutely like, not. No. No, but no. here we are. So it's just like, I'm just like, if I say anything, I'm going to seem thirsty and I'm going to like spring up all these. And I'm just like, I'm also, I think consent's like real important. And I understand that in like fanfic and the fandoms that like a lot of ships fall outside the bounds of what we would consider like even unconventionally acceptable or appropriate relationships. And I was like, my character is a commanding officer. <laughs> They're all really young. I just need to sit all the way back over yeah. here and hope nothing happens. <laughs> like even that scene with Raelle in the beginning where we're like, like this close, like yeah. nose to nose. I was like, like the, <laughs> it was how they framed the shot. It was a super tight shot. So they're like, yeah. get close. And I was like, Taylor just looked at me and was like, you know what's going to happen, right? And I was like, no. But you know what? <laughs> to the fandom's credit, people didn't seem to really lock onto that. Probably no. because, like, Rayella is endgame for yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah. So, whew. yeah. But, like, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm a little shocked that people didn't jump all over some of the thirstier setups that they did with M. Yeah. I'm sorry. But, like, the knife fight. Switch. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> but again, luckily, Lynn Renee was there to save the day, being like hot general mommy, being like, hello, Tally Craven. And everyone was like, that one, we want that one. <laughs> Even though it's like deeply inappropriate. It's so, so inappropriate. She's 350 years old. There's a reason why she's not with anyone. It would be like, I appreciate it. I'm a little scared of it, but like in an excited way, like, what are you going to do next? Oh my Lord. <laughs> Um, I do love the fan art though. I've never yeah. had people do fan art of me with the exception of this one really awesome kid who made a Lego version of Cindy from the boys. That's he does cool. Lego figurine versions of uh, like movie characters and he sent me Cindy. But like, there's been a lot of people drawing M which is yeah. super cool. And I get really bummed out when I miss the notifications and feel bad, but internet culture, yeah. Don't feel um, bad. There's so there's so many, and I think people just love putting their art out to like let everyone, especially the fandom, see because like everyone yeah. gasses each other up. It's just like, yeah, that's sick. Keep going with yeah. it. Yeah, like, yeah. I think I've also been waiting for like the negative part, and it just hasn't happened. I'm not sure it's there in the Motherland fandom. Which yeah. like, even based on what like you and I have been talking about, I'm just like, could this be? Could, could this be a safe space? What? <laughs> What is that? What is that? Yeah. So yeah, the fans are super cool. They 
also fighting tooth and nail for the show. They sent balloons. The balloons. To Hulu. Yep. Everyone was talking about that. Really? The, okay. If any of you are balloon senders or balloon appreciators, just know it was like the talk of set the whole week. Really? Like every shuttle I went, did you see the balloons? Did you hear about the balloons? I'm like, yes, I heard about the balloons by the end of the week. But that was really cool. Good one, y'all. Yeah. And they're also putting up billboards in December. Um, yeah, but so they raise three thousand dollars to get billboards put up in Los Angeles and New York over Christmas. What? Um, yeah, no. So, <laughs> devil works hard. I'm out of the way, loop. Work harder. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Um, wow. So are there any messages that you would love to send to the fans? Just. Now there's- other than sounding like that Owen Wilson audio. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, I mean, I think just like a big thank you. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to join the world of motherland. And it's been an even greater pleasure to see how much like joy and community that it's brought to the people that watch it. Um, it's a privilege to be a part of it. And I'm so excited for me to all see season three once we're done. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet. I can't wait to see what you guys do next. Screw us. What are you going to do next? <laughs> Billboards. Okay. So last thing we're going to do is going to be a little game. It's just fun, silly off the top of your head. Um, I sort of debated with what I was going to do, but I landed on M has been placed into an octagon. No one can use magic. It is just one V one. I'm going to give you characters. You just tell me who's going to win. <laughs> Pause. We haven't discussed at any point that my career prior to being a professional circus artist was being a semi-professional Muay Thai fighter with a North American championship. Okay. So the first one should be easy. M V Tally. M. Sorry, Tally. <laughs> Tally. Uh, it would be it would be a first round, first round knockout. Yeah. <laughs> it would be clean. Yeah. It would be a Connor McGregor situation, the first 12 seconds. <laughs> Jess, if you're watching this, I love you. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, I put that first because she had no chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this game. Okay, next okay. one. So, Anna Kostya. Mm, okay, uh, we would go the distance. Yep. We would go the distance. It would be round for round. We'd be bloodied and bruised. There'd be a lot of, like, eyebrow cuts. The eyes would be puffing up. Some, maybe a busted nose. Yep. Um, I think that... Anacostia would come in as a technical fighter and M would come in as a brawler and it would have to be a judge's decision. Okay. It would be a judge's decision at the end of all of that. And Anacostia might win more technical points. So it would depend on the judges that day. Yeah. All right. I agree with that. I think that's, I think that's definitely it. Um, Gregorio. (laughs) M clean. Come on. (laughs) Sorry, Brini. Come on. (laughs) That scene where Abigail just dumps him on his ass. I wish they'd given Pranit more fight scenes. Like the man's such an angel. He's yeah. so sweet. And I thought he looked great in his little action scene that he had. They should have given him more, but I would totally kick his ass. Oh, definitely. Uh, whenever I think of Gregorio fighting, I just think of him landing on the ground in the defend the hearth thing where he gets, yes. <laughs> where he gets shot. Uh, <laughs> it's the um, hair. He's got like Disney Prince hair. Like it just does. makes everything look so good. Yep. I'm just over here like a bald leg. I can only dream of hair like Pranit's. God, it's very like so handsome. It looks so soft. It's very like and shiny. It's yeah. got like a little Superman curl thing. Like I, that is that is probably capital W work right there. You're right. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, okay, M versus Alda. Oh, you said this is a bare hands fight, no yep. surges yep. and no work. No work. This is going to be unpopular and narcissistic, but M. I think M as well, honestly. On, okay, Lynn is, Lynn is wonderful and Alder being Lynn, but like, have we seen Alder's arms? Yep. They're very high fashion. Yeah. She doesn't, she doesn't need meat. No. She's got she work. Does. She's got scourges. She's got biddies. Exactly. I she's think got- M got so good at hand to hand combat because like at some point, if they were expected to switch into a binary gender before they were like, no, like, screw this. I'm just going to be who I am. I'm non-binary. Fuck the military. But also yeah. I'm part of the military and respect it and love it very much. Uh, is what would you do with the voice change if the American military 
uses vocal working so much. So I think that like Emma's obviously become a very competent soldier, otherwise they wouldn't be in the position they're in. Yeah. But I think that's why they're so good at hand-to-hand -hand combat because they were like, just in case I need to be able to do this. Yeah, okay. That's, that's actually Back really, there. that makes so much sense. Also, I was talking to one of my friends on Twitter about this list and they asked me when I said older, they were like pre-tree older and that made me laugh really hard. <laughs> Oh, right. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if M would win against Tree Alder. I think they'd break their hands, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then that would be it. They'd have to call the fight. They'd call the medic. Yep. Fight would be over. So I agree. Bio Alder, M wins. Tree yeah. Alder, M loses. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Nikta. Oh, you be Arlen. I don't know. <laughs> Arlen's very good. Nikta's also been around for a super long time and they're real agile. And I think we only saw like the scritchiest scratch of the surface of what Nikta can do. I think M, M would be knocked out and wouldn't know how it happened. Ah, okay. You think that Nikta would do something, something a little bit cheaty? Nikta's been around for a super long time. Yeah. And like Arlen is like, Arlen's got like a dancer gymnastic body, like yep. proprioception thing going on. Like... I'm tall. I got the length, but I feel like Nikta could just like kind of like duck under like the crosses yep. and jabs, and just be like done. <laughs> done. KO. Perfect. KO. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Abigail. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. It's a tough one. Yeah. Abigail's got the. Oh no. Well, is Abigail taller than me? Might be. Um. Hmm. 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 Abigail's got some serious rage. I think Abigail will be a brawler as well, but yeah. we've also seen Abigail like get into some situations that she's in over her head. I mean, no fault of her own yeah. in some of those cases. And we also see Abigail really excelling in weapons work, but I don't know that she'd win in hand to hand for mm. the same reason. Formidable weather working witch, yeah. but like also very high fashion arms. Very much so. <laughs> I think I think M would have the experience and then would win, you know. Yeah. These two, the last two, make me laugh because the answer is obvious, but also the idea, the mental image is very funny. So okay. M versus Scylla. Oh God. Do we ever see Scylla fight? I don't think we've ever seen her doing hand to hand. We've seen her doing these ones in front of a in front of Abigail while she was having in front a of a tornado. Of yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm starting to feel like a broken record, but M. Yep. Come on. I agree. Add the last one, Rail. <laughs> Sorry, my brain just went immediately to like the episode two, like standoff. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think I might just like sit on Rail until yeah. like she ran out of breath. I was like, you know, like hand out and Rail's like got the arms swinging running towards. <laughs> I've done that to someone in a fight, made them real mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that. That might be what happens. Yep. <laughs> Taylor, I'm sorry if you ever watch this. I love you too. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been amazing. Hopefully we can do it again after season three. Have a chat about yeah. where your character goes. That'd be rad. I think I'd be at liberty to say a lot more things. So that would Perfect. be good. <laughs> <laughs> um, good luck continuing to film season three. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. This was super fun. Thank My you face hurts from that. smiling for same an hour and a half an hour and a half yeah and i'll Sweet. look forward to chatting with you next time yes definitely okay Sweet. cool see you next time bye bye